Hi guys, so this is chapter 26, the urinary system. Um, we're going to start talking about the functions. The functions are excretion of your metabolic wastes from the bloodstream. So the key is blood. You are constantly filtering the blood in your kidneys, um, and the kidneys are going to allow uh, the wanted substances in the blood to stay in the blood and all those metabolic wastes. So metabolic wastes are waste from your cells that when your cells are, um, for example, your liver, is getting rid of some toxins. Uh, those byproducts of small molecules will travel in your bloodstream and they'll leave, uh, be filtered out at the kidney. Um, number two, maintain water, electrolyte, and salt balance. So um, in physiology, you'll learn more um, detailed version of this, but your kidneys are responsible for um, how much sodium or potassium or um, chlorine, like those salt and, and different electrolytes, like, like potassium, I said. Uh, will stay or leave your body. Um, so it has a large deal to manage salt concentration in your body. And um, as we know, salt is related to um, sort of um, holding water in through osmotic pressure. Um, so your kidneys um, can work to also indirectly control your blood pressure because your blood pressure works on how much fluid is in your bloodstream. Um, but anyways, there's a lot of um, a fine little detail of what your kidney does in that water, electrolyte, salt balance. Um, number three, pH, uh, because the hydrogen ion is, uh, you know, what pH is all about. So the more hydrogen ions you have in the blood, the more acidic that uh, blood or any fluid is. And so your kidneys are responsible for excretion and absorption. So maintaining the pH balance of your tissues in your bloodstream. So it's a very important job there. Also at the nephron. Um, number four, it secretes a couple of um, important molecules. Renin is a molecule that indirectly leads to an increase of blood pressure. And I'm not going to go into this in any detail. I will talk about in a little bit later on where renin is created. But um, there is a pathway called the renin angiotensin pathway that you guys will learn in physiology that um, renin is a necessary molecule to eventually raise your blood pressure. Um, and then letter B, erythropoietin, is a hormone. And I talked about erythropoietin in uh, the hematopoiesis and the blood chapter a little bit, but it's going to stimulate red blood cell protect production. It's a hormone. Um, and I'll show you later on where that's produced. Okay, so number five, vitamin D activation. So um, that's also very important for your kidneys. So we have five functions of the kidneys, very broad functions. Um, so let's take a look at the um, urinary system. And we can see that it's not very complicated um, from the sort of gross anatomy standpoint. There are two kidneys. We have a right and left kidney. Um, if you take a careful look, they're not at the same level, are they? So it looks like your right kidney is slightly lower than the left side. And what might be uh, the source of this or the reason for the right kidney being lower? And uh, the reason is because your liver is lopsided, right? The liver, the right lobe of the liver is a larger lobe and it's going to take up some space here in the abdominal cavity. So the right kidney is a little bit lower than the left side. Um, so the kidneys are going to produce the urine. So again, they're filtering the blood, producing urine. The urine will then travel away from the kidney and enter into a ureter. The ureter is a um, tube that carries the urine into the bladder. The urinary bladder stores the urine. And then the urethra will carry the urine out the body. There are other uh, associated structures that are pretty obvious here. The suprarenal gland is also known as your adrenal gland. So you have two adrenal glands um, on top of each kidney. So we call this, we say that this is the superior pole of the kidney has the suprarenal gland. Then we have our large uh, renal arteries and veins coming into the kidney. Uh, we have the inferior vena cava and aorta. These all should all be very familiar to you guys. So let's take a look at um, the position of the kidney just once again. Um, so you can see that the right kidney is lower than the left. Um, looking at this, a lot of people sometimes are surprised the kidneys are a little higher than they thought. Uh, the kidneys, um, if I ask someone to point to their kidneys, normally they say right above their hips, they'll point to here. Sort of right, right, but they're a little bit higher than that. 
actually covered by the last two ribs. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is just a, a way of looking at the kidneys that sometimes surprises students that they're a little bit higher up and partially covered by the ribs, the last two inferior ribs. <clears throat> Let's take a look at this picture. So this is going to be a cross section of the abdomen and we can see the kidney here. So we only see one kidney in this picture. Um, and we can see that um, looking at your notes, there are three layers of the kidney. Um, there's number one, the renal capsule, uh, perirenal fat, and then the renal fascia. So let's just find those on the picture. The capsule itself, okay, this fibrous capsule is part of the organ of the kidney. So the kidney itself is wrapped in this tough connective tissue called the capsule. So the capsule is all around the kidney, kind of like your lymph nodes had a capsule or your spleen, right? So then above the kidney, we're going to have fat. Um, your book has changed um, the term from perirenal fat to perinephric fat. Either term is acceptable. So that's going to be some adipose tissue that's going to cushion the kidney. And then we have fascia, right? So if you look at where the line is going, it's going to this white connective tissue here. So the fascia is going to bind the perirenal fat to the kidney and stabilize the kidney in the space that it it is found. So um, you can see the, the descriptions um, in your outline. All right, so if you look at layers inside the kidney, within the kidney, you have two distinct kinds of tissue. And if you look at this cartoon, you can see how the outer part of the kidney is a light orange. Then we have these areas of pink. So the outer portion is called the cortex and the inner portion is called the medulla. Okay, so let's take a look at um, another picture. Here's your real kidney. So this is this picture, let me just go back real quick. Here's the stomach, here's the spleen, okay? So if we have the spleen, what side are we on? We're on the left side, right? So um, here's your aorta, your inferior vena cava, your vertebra, your little spinal cord. So here's that same image, um, but a real cadaver shot. So I like to, I don't know, I always love how small the spinal cord is. It's just kind of that point of, astonishment every time I see the spinal cord and how truly tiny it is and how large that vertebral uh, foramen is in the body of the vertebra in comparison. Um, here's our kidney. Um, here's the, you know, the uh, cortex, which is lighter in color. The medulla is a, a different kind of tissue, different coloration. Here's the stomach. You can see the folds or the rugae within the stomach. And then here's our spleen. All right. So, um, the gross anatomy of the kidney is pretty simple. You know, it's kidney bean shaped and I have no idea what came first. <laughs> the kidney bean, uh, calling the kidney bean uh, shape, probably not, probably the kidney. Okay, so we have this dent here. Uh, that's the hilum of the kidney, okay? And so the hilum is gonna contain the renal artery, renal vein, and then your reader leaving the kidney. And then this is a good, uh, so you're gonna want to know this diagram. You're gonna want to know uh, several diagrams I'll show you on the way I'm scrolling through here. So let me concentrate on this one. So this is, um, let's start with uh, layers of the kidney letter B. Okay, so let's just make sure we know our layers. The outer portion of the kidney is called the cortex, right? So we can see that the cortex word is just the entire outside. So you can say, you know, the most superficial layer of the kidney is the cortex. Then inside the cortex, that region is called the medulla. Now, found within the medulla are two areas. The first area is this nice pyramid. This is called a renal pyramid, right? The word is right here. The second area that's in the medullary region is an extension of the cortex, right? So here's the cortex. It comes between the renal pyramids. So this region is called the renal columns, right? The word is right here. So within the medulla, right, within this inner part of the kidney, we have both renal pyramids and we have renal columns. The cortex is just cortex, okay? So um, let's take a look at um, the, the med, the, sorry. Number two, the inner renal medulla, we have six to 18 pyramids and the base of the pyramids faces the cortex. The tip of the pyramid is called the papilla, okay? So the base, this wide part here that faces the cortex is called the base of the pyramid. The point is called the papilla, or the renal papilla. Um, let's take a look at the next port, 
next part of our outline, we have some calyces. So the cortex and medulla, this is where the nephron is found and that's the microscopic unit of the kidney that actually filters the blood. So all throughout the cortex and medulla, it's busy filtering your blood. When that blood is filtered and sort of concentrated, the end product is urine. So the urine is going to be sort of released from the renal papillae. So this sort of part here is going to drip urine into this very first little catchment basin, and that's called the minor calyx. All right, so here's a minor calyx, here's a minor calyx, minor calyx. So you see the word here, minor calyx, right? The plural form is calyces. I have it um, in your outline. So when the urine is initially caught by that minor calyx, it'll uh, sort of leave this space and then join up with another minor calyx. And this junction between two or more minor calyces would be called a major calyx, right? So that you see that here. So um, let's say I have my pointer here. This is, would be a major calyx, okay? So this area here is a major calyx. There's one, two, three minor calyces. Here, that, this depression refers to if this was a three-dimensional kidney, you go back in space, there's another minor calyx behind this. There, there it is. So we have a convergence of minor calyces to form a major calyx. When all the major calyces converge here, that's called the pelvis, okay? So the renal pelvis will uh, basically be right before the exit into the ureter, all right? So... Um, that's basically it. So um, the renal sinus is just a space in this region here. So it's a little crook or space within the, to, within the organ itself. Um, here's our fibrous capsule, the outer part of the kidney. And I think I mentioned everything else in this picture. Okay, so moving on. This is a nice um, real kidney to look at. So we can see, again, the difference in texture between the cortex and medulla. We can see a minor calyx, right? We can see, actually see these things here as a major calyx because I can see one minor calyx here, another one here, this is major. Here's our pelvis, right? And then there's the ureter. So let me mention hilum. Remember hilum was it's just that curved region of the organ where you have the blood vessels and the ureter. So don't get hilum and pelvis confused. The pelvis is internal. It's a space that will route the urine into the ureter. The hilum is just a region, right, this curved area, the dent, where um, the blood vessels in the ureter are um, going to enter and exit. All right, here's just a nice three-dimensional image of the calyces um, and um, how we have you know, them converging onto the pelvis and the ureter. All right, so next part here, the nephron. So this is where the lecture is gonna get a little bit more detailed. Um, this image is, uh, let's understand this. So the, the purple part of this image is the nephron. The nephron is the structural and functional unit of the kidney that's going to filter the blood, okay? So it's um, this first part here, which is called the renal corpuscle. You can see that here. This is what the blood is gonna enter into, okay? And we're gonna filter the blood within this ball and then the blood's gonna come in through the afferent arterial and exit through the efferent arterial. I will, I will go over this again. Then the fluid that is created after you filter that blood is called filtrate, and that filtrate is going to travel through this tube, right? So the nephron is really just a little tube called a tubule. There are different parts to it, right? But this filtrate's gonna travel through and then finally, it'll reach the end of what we call the nephron and then enter into a collecting system called the collecting duct, which is why it's a different color. The collecting duct is technically not part of the nephron. So the collecting duct is gonna collect that, um, that fluid and then the fluid will travel down the collecting duct. And even at this level, we're not calling it urine yet because it still can get modified. Um, there are still some processes that can um, change the amount of water you're letting go or you're going to retain. And then um, at this part here, the most inferior portion of the collecting duct, it's going to change name to papillary duct, okay? 
So the collecting duct is the sort of upper portion. And when it gets down here, it's called the papillary duct. And then that, when it hits the papillary duct, now we call it urine, okay? And then that very first space, remember when we called uh, that first catchment system, it's the minor calyx, okay? So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this and um, we're gonna stretch this guy out just a little bit. So we're gonna take a look at this picture um, and then go back to this and, and hopefully it'll make sense. So here is the um, letter A in your outline, the glomerulus. So these are the blood vessels that are coming into this yellow area called Bowman's capsule. The glomerulus is a capillary inside of it. Let me go show, I'll show you this. This is just a, a big blow up of this region here, right? So let me um, introduce a couple of words. The word um, renal corpuscle, okay, number one in your outline, renal corpuscle, that is this entire structure that is um, in the box. It's actually just this round part right here, okay? So the corpuscle, if you follow my pointer, it's going down here, right? This is the corpuscle. And the corpuscle is divided into all these different subparts, right? So let's go through the subparts. Letter A is the glomerulus. So this red uh, blood vessel that you can see poking through the purple cells, that's the glomerulus. The glomerulus is a fenestrated capillary. So remember that the word fenestrated means porous, or it has regular pores. And when you have a blood vessel that has holes in it, it's gonna let a lot of things out, right? So this is good because we wanna filter the blood for all these molecules that we don't want in our body that's waste. So the blood is coming in through the afferent arterial, A, afferent coming in. The blood vessel, this is an arterial, right? This is not a capillary yet. So it's an arterial bringing the blood in. Um, once it comes into the um, corpuscle, then it becomes a capillary, which we call the glomerulus. The blood will travel through the capillary network and then come out and exit through the efferent arterial. Okay, so let's take a look at what's going on here. Um, the other purple parts of this, right? So the other part besides that capillary network is going to be called Bowman's capsule, number letter B in your outline, or it can be called the glomerular capsule. Um, that's what your textbook calls it, the glomerular capsule, although Bowman's capsule is really widely referred to as well. And I, I like Bowman's capsule. I think it just comes off the tongue. It's easier to say than glomerular capsule. So I'm going to stick to Bowman's. Anyhow, so Bowman's capsule comes in two layers. There's the outer layer here, right, which forms the outside of the, of the corpuscle, which is called the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule. And you might have guessed it, the inner part, these purple cells that are on top of the glomerulus is the visceral layer of Bowman's capsule. Okay, so these, these cells here, these purple cells that are on top of the glomerulus, these also are called podocytes. Okay, so if I point to these and I say, name this structure, you can either say visceral layer of Bowman's capsule, or you can say podocytes. Either one is correct. Okay, so um, let's just stay here for a real quick. So now notice that there's a space, right? There's a space. It's going to be the capsular space. This is sometimes also referred to as the subcapsular space or Bowman's space. Okay, so lots of words, but it's the space. And this space is going to collect the filtered fluid from the bloodstream. So the blood comes in, uh, waste and fluids are filtered out and they're caught in this capsular space. This fluid is called filtrate. Okay, so you can find the word filtrate under letter A of glomerulus. So the filtrate is going to then get routed out through um, this very first exit, which is going to be the very first part of the nephron here, which is going to be called the proximal convoluted tubule, okay? PCT for short, but if you are typing this out on your test or writing it out on the test, you have to put proximal convoluted tubule. Um, 
so uh, basically, right, so let's take a look here. There's our glomerulus, this yellow part, that's gonna be our, our Bowman's capsule. This is the proximal convoluted tubule. And the proximal convoluted tubule is named that way because it's next to, or the very first structure that the filtrate comes into. Um, I'll mention that the filtrate changes name once it becomes, it gets into the tubes, it's called tubular fluid. Um, so that fluid's gonna move through the proximal convoluted tubule. What convoluted means is that it's, um, it's windy, right? It's folded up. And so that's that. And then it comes down, it forms a loop. So there's a, this is called the nephron loop or the loop of Henle. Okay. I, I like the loop of Henle. It's what I learned, but nephron loop is fine. Um, you can see there's thick parts of the loop. And there's thin parts of the loop. Um, but those are not important for us right now. Um, let's just call this the descending limb. Right, so everything where the filtrate goes down or so the tubular fluid goes down is called the descending limb of the loop of Henle. When it comes back up, it's the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Then we come to another convoluted region, and this is going to be called the distal convoluted tubule, right? It's going to be opposite the proximal. The distal convoluted tubule is another tube, so it's going to wind, and then uh, all through the nephron, all through the PCT, the loop, the DCT, the water, the filtrate is getting modified and then we're reaching into the collecting system, right? So the collecting duct is next. The collecting duct becomes the papillary duct. The papillary duct then releases into the minor helix, okay? So I wanna show you something. Um, there is a dotted line here. Everything above the dotted line is found in the cortex of the kidney everything below the dotted line is found in the medulla of the kidney. And that's important. So we're gonna look at histology. And uh, so when you look at histology, only the cortex, you'll find these renal corpuscles, you're gonna find PCT and DCT sections, and then only in the medulla, you're gonna find these loops, okay? Um, let's go and look at the filtration membrane. Okay, so letter C. All right, so when you are filtering the blood, just like if you're filtering coffee, right? You have a coffee filter. You have this piece of paper that holds back the coffee grounds and lets the water go through, right? And the smaller molecules go through. So that's what your kidney does. Your kidney has a filter, but this filter is made of three parts and they're organic molecules, right? So let's take a look at the three parts of the filtration membrane which is A, the fenestrated glomerular endothelium, which is basically saying it's the capillary's wall, right? The capillary endothelium, of course, because if you're a little piece of uh, metabolic waste inside the blood vessel and you're trying to move out, right? The first thing you're going to encounter is basically the wall of the capillary itself. So that's that. So um, only substances that are allowed through those fenestrations or they're small enough that they can permeate right through the membrane, those are going to exit. This is gonna block the passage of any of the cells, right? So red blood cells, white blood cells, those are not gonna be filtered out, they're too big. Now, the next thing you're gonna come across is the basal lamina, and that should make sense because remember that we learned that anytime you have epithelial cells, you're gonna have a basal lamina um, we also call it the basement membrane, right, which is a bunch of little molecules, and they're going to block proteins. So now we're hitting this wall where it's going to be basically full of these, you know, the basement membrane is not going to allow large proteins to go through. So things like albumin, for example, or your clotting factors, they're not going to get wasted in your urine. You're going to keep those in the bloodstream. Those are bigger proteins. Then you're going to find the last barrier are filtration slits. This is where the podocytes come in. So those purple cells that were on top of your glomerulus, those cells had foot processes. Let me show you that picture again, right? So look how these cells have these stringy like extensions of themselves. Those are called uh, foot processes. And the slits between them right? Those are called filtration slits. 
So the filtration slits or filtration slits between the processes or the podocytes is a, a third barrier. So the molecules will also have to fit through those little filtration slits. Okay. And these are going to block the passage of almost all of your plasma proteins. So urine, right? If you have healthy urine, you have a healthy kidney, nothing, there should be no proteins, no big proteins in the urine. There should be no red blood cells or white blood cells in the urine. Um, so if you find that a person has albumin in their urine, that means that there's something wrong with their kidney because this filtration membrane has been compromised, right? It's like punching a hole through your coffee filter. If you're going to get grounds in your coffee, you're like, oh, something was messed up with my filter. It's the same thing here, right? So your, your kidney is getting damaged. There's something going on with the filtration membrane. If you find, again, if you find like large proteins in the urine. Okay, so that's that, all right? So filtration membrane. Um, so now let's look at the tubules again. Let's go back and look at our tubules. So one thing I want you guys to notice here is that the proximal convoluted tubule is drawn as cuboidal cells with microvilli, okay? Very long, hairy, hair-like <laughs> microvilli. Remember, microvilli is to increase the surface area of the cells. So something's going on here, right? You don't just make microvilli for fun. Microvilli are there for a reason. So in this very first part, this proximal convoluted tubule, we're going to have cuboidal cells with microvilli, and they are going to reabsorb, reabsorb water ions and all organic nutrients. So let's say that some vitamins came out of your um, bloodstream or glucose, sugar, right? Your body wants that back. That's useful stuff. So it's going to get reabsorbed through the PCT. So the PCT is longer than the DCT because the PCT has a special job of resorption. Now the DCT does not. Look at the um, histology of the DCT. You only have the cuboidal cells. You don't have those microvilli. So you're not reabsorbing here, right? You have some resorption, resor reabsorption, but not a whole bunch. This part, the PCT, so star this, this is really important, that the proximal convoluted tubule region is responsible for reabsorption of most of the things that your body wants back, okay? Um, so when we get into the loop, this becomes more important in physiology, not here, but we have the loop that goes down, the loop that comes up, um, and then the DCT, again, we're reabsorbing some things, not a whole lot. And then by the time we get to the collecting duct, um, where very little absorption is going to happen again. But the, everything's, uh, basically everything is going to be cuboidal, okay? Everything is cuboidal, except for when you get to the thin areas, then you have squamous, okay? And uh, the corpuscle itself, the outer layer, this parietal layer of Bowman's capsule, this is going to be a squamous layer, okay? And then when we look at this drawing, we have the red glomerulus itself, the capillary, and then we have the purple podocytes covering it. All right, so I think that's it. For number two, we covered number two, um, and I guess I didn't really use this. Yeah, it just had the nice cortex and medulla um, division. N normally in class, I'd have you guys draw this, but we're not in class. So um, next up, we have the types of nephrons. Um, before Sorry, I hit pause by accident. So before we go on to the types of nephrons, we're just looking at a nice three-dimensional SEM of um, the gold are the blood vessels that are leading to the glomerulus, these capillary networks. Okay, so we've removed other structures. We're just looking at the blood vessels. This is a really cool picture of the podocytes, right? So we can see the filtration slits uh, created here. All right, so looking at kidney histology, oh, I forgot to put this in here. Um, so this is a kidney, and <clears throat> this is very uh, zoomed out. I'm not actually sure what the magnification is, but you can really tell the difference between the, the cortex and medulla, right? So here's the cortex, then we have uh, the medulla. So B and C are both the medulla, very different than the cortex. And then here in this bracket, right, you can see how it dips down like this. This is going to be the papilla, the renal papilla, where we find the papillary duct. Okay, so if you forgot 
let's go back. <laughs> Remember, this is the papillary duct. Why did we change the collecting duct into the wood papillary duct? Because the papillary duct is found within the papilla. And I want to go up and show you again the papilla, right? So remember that point, if you guys don't remember here, the word papilla. So this point coming in, right, that's where you find the papillary duct. And then you're going to find a lot of collecting ducts in this upper part of the medulla. So let's go back and look at that picture. Sorry for the scrolling. Um, and then letter E, right, what would the space be? That would be the minor helix because that's where the urine is going to be um, going when it's coming out of the papillary ducts. So you want to be able to label everything here, A, B, C, D, E. This is another image of the kidney, right? So if you see a picture like this, you're going to have to know that this is a kidney. You can also see the cortex here. And you can see the medulla here, okay, and you can see the papilla here, and the space, this little smile, right, that's all the minor helix. This is going to be the cortex. So what's really going to tell you it's the cortex is the uh, corpuscles. Remember the word renal corpuscle is going to have Bowman's capsule plus the glomerulus inside. So it's going to look like a little flower. Uh, I don't know if it looks like a flower or a rose or some kind of structure to you. Whatever it looks like to you, that's what it is. So uh, that's your renal corpuscle, this term here. Now, inside the renal corpuscle, right, we have the glomerulus. So this wad of cells, that's our glomerulus, of course, it's the glomerulus plus the podocytes. However, I just simplified it for you and it's called the glomerulus. Um, then we have this space, right, Bowman space. That's the little crack of white you see here. That should be pretty obvious. And then PCT versus DCT. So how can you tell uh, proximal convoluted tubule versus distal convoluted tubule? Well, the one huge anatomical difference is the microvilli. What that does is traps um, substances and um, in the PCT. And when you look at this slide, you don't see a whole lot of spaces, right? You see areas that are sort of light pink that if you look at the cells, so if you look here, I can see some cells making like a little circle and the inside is all pink. The inside's all pink. Those are proximal convoluted tubules. There's areas of here that are all proximal, con this is all proximal convoluted tubule. If you see a lumen, aha, here, for example, here, for example, here. Those are DCTs, distal convoluted tubules, because there's no microvilli that's um, coming into the lumen. It's going to be clear. The cuboidal cells are also a little shorter, so you're just going to have more of a clear lumen. Another trick is that the PCT, for some reason, stains more light pink, whereas the DCT picks up a darker stain. Okay, so let's take a look at our close-up histology slide. This is going to be our space, right? This is going to be our glomerulus. So I'm not going to worry about the podocytes. You don't need to worry about that. Just call this glomerulus. <clears throat> you can see very clearly the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule. <clears throat> you can see the DCT here, and here's another DCT. And then you see how the PCT, it looks like there's stuff inside. This one over here, too, is a PCT. So proximal convoluted tubules are going to be... Um, there's just going to be gunk inside of them, okay? So DCTs are clear. PCTs have substances inside. Now, we're getting to something I haven't talked about yet. This is called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Between the DCT here and the glomerulus, there's a collection of cells that is called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. I'm going to get to that um, next. And these are specialized cells that have, there's three different parts of this, but they're specialized to create renin, to create the erythropoietin, etc. Okay, so you want to know all the things here. So the juxtaglomerular apparatus, you're going to have to have sort of a close-up picture of this. It's always going to be, if this looks like a tree, like it's a big bushy tree, then the roots of that tree will be the just juxtaglomerular apparatus because the everything around that tree is going to be a space. It's going to be Bowman space. Okay. So um, let me just show you again, this DCT here, 
let me go back up and show you. I, was, I meant to show you this earlier. <clears throat> you see how this tube is called the distal convoluted tubule. When the, let me just show you this, when the nephron is formed, right, you have the proximal convoluted tubule coming away, the loop, and then the distal convoluted tubule comes back and hits the, this region here, the, the corpuscle, okay? So this is the DCT, the distal convoluted tubule is going to be right next to our corpuscle. So when you take a look at this picture, this is our DCT, and that little juxtaglomerular apparatus or juxtaglomerular complex, another term, um, is three things here, here, and here. And so this region, you want to be able to say it's the juxtaglomerular complex or apparatus. All right, so let's take a look at, let's continue on and take a look at that. Okay, so we were going to get to this, two, the types of nephrons, number three. The types of nephrons are cortical nephrons and juxtamedullary nephrons. Um, they're, they're pictured here. One is shorter and one is a lot longer, okay? This is a cortical nephron. These nephrons are higher up in the cortex and sometimes they're entirely in the cortex. They don't really dip down as the medulla a lot. The medullary line might be here. The juxtamedullary nephron is a longer nephron and it's gonna be more like what we were talking about where the, the line that differentiates cortex and medulla is here, where this stuff is found in the cortex, and the very long loop of Henle reaches into the medulla, okay? So cortical nephrons are mostly in the cortex, juxtamedullary nephrons go deep into the medulla. Um, your, most of your nephrons are cortical nephrons. Okay, um, let's look at the peritubular capillaries in this picture, number four. So remember the nephron is responsible for reabsorbing, right? Reabsorbing things lost in that filtrate. Well, where is it gonna go? Once the tubules of the nephron reabsorb it, it has to go back into the bloodstream. So the network of capillaries around the nephron to receive those items is called the peritubular capillaries, okay? So look at this. Remember the afferent arterial, this is the structure that brings blood into our Bowman's capsule. The inside Bowman's capsule, we have the glomerulus. The blood exits via the efferent arterial, right, E for exit. Then the efferent arterial comes back around and picks up anything that the nephron wants to reabsorb. Okay, and then once it does that, it's gonna become a vein, all right, and then come out, out of the kidney. So blood comes into the kidney, gets filtered, it gets back, it just picks up what it wants back, and then here's that little vein. So once it's be done picking up everything as a capillary, it forms veins and will go leave the leave the kidney. Okay, so um, I'm going to pause it and we'll pick this up next with the next lecture.